हेलो एवरीवन गुड इवनिंग हेलो सृष्टि गुड इवनिंग प्लीज कंफर्म इफ आई एम ऑडिबल एंड द ऑडियो इज फाइन प्लीज कंफर्म इफ माय ऑडियो इज फाइन एंड आई एम ऑडिबल टू ऑल ऑफ यू okay thank you shristi so let's get started with today's lecture so today we are going to start with surface and uh, we'll cover drt uh, one of the important chapter from your examination point of view uh, both old as well as the new syllabus so uh, this is the slide that i had used uh, apart from the bare act like i mentioned uh, these are the class slides where i have just summed up the entire uh, surface part so we can have a complete discussion based on this okay and uh, thereafter we'll go ahead and we'll cover the entire chapter okay so let's get started and uh, surface again uh, it's one of the recovery tool right this is a law which is there for the recovery tool it is not a uh, law like insolvency where it provides uh, resolution it's for the recovery so if you see this is the bank and the financial institution and this is the surface this is surface okay this is surface and this is the borrower who has defaulted and here when i say default again the definition changes there is no threshold of the default all it says that it has to be an npa so if it's a npa uh, this surface act can get triggered and you can the banks and the financial institutions basically they can invoke surface right now uh, just see this came this act came as an ordinance so we know when the parliament is not in function you have a ordinance and passed and thereafter when the parliament re resumes or when the parliament is there uh, at that point of time you can have a discussion and get that particular law passed so surface act was again uh, passed like an ordinance right so when this act was passed that time parliament was not in operation but later on uh, it was approved by both the houses of the parliament and it became a act so this law the objective of this law was so this is the objective of the law the objective of the law was uh, to provide secured creditors a tool okay and when i say secured creditors it just means the banks and the financial institution so it provides the secured creditors a tool to recover their dues okay they can recover their dues without the intervention of the court now if you remember we discussed about the debt recovery tribunal the banks and the recovery of the debt and the financial institute recovery of debt due to the banks in the financial institution act i just open the blank slide also so that can again uh, give me some okay so the ppirp slide only i am just i just write whatever i have to explain for uh, surface here also okay so because until i scribble something few things i i don't feel comfortable teaching so just see that um, if you see the, uh, you had the recovery of debt due to the banks and financial institution act okay under this act uh, the debt recovery tribunals were set up now the debt recovery tribunals were the dedicated tribunal if you remember we discussed this on the first day when we had started with the insolvency part so this was the dedicated tribunal okay which provided for the recovery for the banks and the financial institutions right later on uh, we realized that drt wasn't doing good so we we i mean government when i say we i, I represent india i say government right so government then decided that let's keep drt as it is but let's give these banks and the financial institutions let's make make a separate law which basically provides these banks and the financial institutions a tool to recover their dues right without the intervention of the court so this tool was surface now the full form of surface is sa rafa and esi so just to remember the uh, law name and anyway you have three work that is covered under surface so one is the securitization activity right 
and the reconstruction of financial assets and the enforcement of the security interest. So this act was passed and basically what this act did is uh, empower the banks and the financial institutions to recover their dues without the intervention of the court and also provide for the securitization, right? A route for the securitization. So this is the SA activity, which I mentioned. Now to invoke Sarfesi, first and foremost, like I mentioned, the borrower's account needs to be a NPA. Now, what is an NPA? So NPA is again defined. Uh, so one, what happens? See, when what's the difference between IBC and Sarfesi? So understand as soon as the default takes place, okay? As soon as the default takes place, we say that uh, IBC can be invoked. But here, when the default takes place, for 90 days okay for a period of 90 days as per the rbi prudential norms we say that the bank uh, the borrower's account is a standard asset now understand when the banks and the financial institution so what assets does the blank bank and the financial institutions are going to have they won't have plant and machinery they are not going to, of course they may have land and building but they won't have plant and machinery they won't have capital assets what they are going to have is all the monetary assets that the amount which they have lent to the companies right so only these assets would be there now when we do we say that a asset is a performing asset or the asset is non-performing so when the asset does what it has or what it is intended to do right so you have created that asset you have purchased that asset you have acquired that asset whatever you say that uh, with an underlying objective and a purpose so if that particular asset is doing that work we say that uh, the asset is performing and if it doesn't work, we say the asset is non-performing. Take for example, uh, I have an air conditioner right now, right? So the purpose of this air conditioner is to uh, keep the temperature uh, comparatively lower than what it is outside or keep the room hum free of humidity, right? So this is the function of this air conditioner. Some of you right now uh, are watching this video from north. So you must be having a heater right now, okay? So what's the objective or what's the purpose of that heater is to keep the room warm. Now, if the AC keeps the room cool, if the heater keeps the room warm, we say the asset is performing. If it doesn't, then we say the asset is not performing, right? So same thing when these monetary assets. So what's the objective of these monetary assets? We say that uh, bank have given these monetary assets or bank have given these loan and created these monetary assets for a regular stream of income. And this can be by way of interest or emis right now till the time bank is getting the bank and the financial institution they are getting the steady flow of uh, interest and the emis we say the asset is performing now once this does stops we say the asset is not performing right but the moment it stops we don't say the asset is not performing so for a period of 90 days we say that this is still a standard asset so till the time the interest payments are being received we say it's a standard asset and even uh, we give a buffer time of 90 days that quite possible there can be an accidental default or whatsoever. So this I'm just making it up just for the understanding. We can say that for a period of 90 days, it is still considered as an asset, uh, standard asset. Don't say it's a non-performing asset. For 90 days, even if there is a default, just wait for 90 days and check. After 90 days time period, we put that asset into the category of non-performing asset. So here it is a performing asset. Okay. Till that time, it's a standard asset. Before default, standard asset. It's a performing asset. After default, it's a standard asset, but it's a performing asset, but that's only up to 90 days. Once this 90 days period gets over, after that, we say, this is what, this is a substandard asset. So from here on, so from here on till next one year, okay? From here on till next one year, we say that this is what, this is a substandard asset. It's a substandard asset. And thereafter, we say it's a loss asset. And finally, uh, we say doubtful. So here, are, then it is called as the doubtful asset. And then it's called as the loss asset. So it is also possible that you may call it as a loss asset right after this 90 days when you believe that this amount will not be recoverable. So I hope the concept of non-performing asset is clear. By the way, uh, I still remember in my CA final exam, Sarfesi was part of the CA final syllabus. So at that point of time, we had this four mark question from Sarfesi. What is a non-performing asset? So I was actually very surprised when I got this question. I'm talking about CA final, not CS final. So in CA final, when this question was asked, it was like, 
a surprise question because traditionally you have uh, so many things to ask from Sarfesi, but Institute had asked only one question. That's what's non -per not per non performing asset, right? The definition of non performing asset. However, for you guys, again, I'm not saying that it cannot be asked. I uh, vaguely I remember, I think in one of the attempt, uh, it, this question was there that what's a non performing asset new syllabus students, I would again say, highly recommend that just watch, uh, watch for this, you may get this asset of the definition of a non performing asset. So moving ahead, uh, till the 90 days, it is a standard asset. And once it becomes a NPS, so from here on, you say surface comes into picture so pata poster nikla hero ye kabhi hoga 90 days ke baad so pata poster right 90 days ke baad patega poster and then aega hero hero kon hai bank and financial institution ke liye it's the surface act now when i say surface act will get triggered after this default i just mean uh, for the sa and the so the the rafa and the esi activity so this will get triggered only after the default okay this happens after the default when it becomes a NPA. But when I say surface, this part, okay, this will happen before NPA. Now, what is this? We'll discuss that. This is before NPA, before default. After default, no one is actually going to do the securitization activity. It may happen, but usually you won't find securitization activity happening after default. Securitization activity happens before the default. And after default, you'll have only the RAFA activity and the ESI activity. So here, if you see, uh, once the assets the, of the borrower, it becomes NPA, surface, the ESI and the RAFA activity gets triggered. And basically the banks and the financial institutions, they can take the action against the borrower. So you need not go to the DRT, right? Also, uh, like I mentioned, the three activities which will be provided in surface. So one is the securitization activity. Another is the reconstruction of financial asset, and third is the enforcement of security interest. So it's not securitization activity in the act. The act name is service is securitization and reconstruction. So don't write securitization activity, reconstruction of financial assets. It's securitization and reconstruction, right? Also, it provided a route for setting up of an asset reconstruction company, which was earlier called as a reconstruction company and securitization company. Thereafter, both these terminologies were merged and we say that let's have one particular company which will do both the reconstruction of financial asset, enforcement of security interest and securitization activity. So earlier you had two separate companies. One was securitization company, which would do only the securitization activity. And there would be another company which would do the reconstruction a company which would do the RAFA and the ESI activity. But now you have both the concepts merge and you have just one ARC which will do both the work. So I hope with this introduction, we can just start with. So Sarfesi Act, if you can see, there are six chapters, 42 sections, and then there are enforcement of, uh, enforcement of security interest rules. So like I mentioned, what was the need for Sarfesi? Because there were a lot of pending cases in DRT that's required that made the mandatory requirement for the need of surface uh, right but again surface couldn't do well why because of the political interventions and the corruptions in the system that's uh, where surface failed and now we have again ibc the ibc has come and it has not repealed surface remember uh, sika is repealed okay after ibc sika is repealed but surface is still there and also understand the jurisdiction or the objective of the two laws surface the law the objective is that it's a recovery tool for insolvency bankruptcy code it's a resolution tool it's not a recovery tool okay so what is going to happen just see uh, this is step by step i have mentioned how surface is going to work so loan would be extended to the borrower okay and then the borrower is uh, going to default and then the account of the borrower would become npa so once the borrower's account become npa that's where the banks and the financial institutions they get the power to take action under section 13 and uh, what is under section 13 that's the recovery tool which is their enforcement of security interest right so section 13 and that's where you do the recovery without the intervention of the court so surface act uh, first is the securitization activity where the banks and the financial institutions they transfer the account of the borrower to this asset reconstruction company and the asset reconstruction company on the basis of this uh, account which is being transferred to the asset reconstruction company and the securities underlying securities of this borrower 
based on this uh, the security receipts would be issued to the qualified buyer so it's similar to your adr gdr right like how it happens in case of adr gdr you have the underlying uh, shares which are there in the uh, custody of the domestic custodian bank on the basis of that overseas depository issue security receipts so here also it's the same thing the borrower is has pledged okay has created security interest over its asset uh, because the bank has given the loan so to secure that loan the security interest has been created and that's the role of the uh, securitization activity that on the basis of that security interest the asset reconstruction company is, is, is going to issue the security receipts to the qualified buyers also the second activity which is the reconstruction of the financial assets that's rafa activity here basically uh, multiple recourse have been given to the borrower uh, to the creditor right where uh, there are provisions like the extension of loan or conversion of the loan and then waive of part of the loan so basically understand what's the difference between the rafa activity and the esi activity so while you are going to study the rafa activity under section 9 it also includes the esi activity right but the esi activity uh, is like basically it is like this if i say the reconstruction of financial assets okay so there are multiple measures which are there which you can do under reconstruction of financial assets okay one of the measure is enforcement of security interest <coughs> sorry one of the major is enforcement of security interest now the difference but another difference between the rafa and the esi activity is that the reconstruction of financial asset can be done by both secured as well as an unsecured creditor okay but if you have to enforce the security interest then you have to be a secured creditor it is not available to an unsecured creditor it is available only to the secured creditor similarly if you see the securitization activity okay the securitization activity can only be done by the secured creditor and not by the unsecured creditor so is sarfc only for the secured creditor answer is no sarfc has got three activities sa activity rafa activity and the esi activity where the rafa activity is a recourse which is available for both secured as well as an unsecured creditor but the esi and the securitization activity can be done only by the secured creditors and not by the unsecured creditors okay so if you get a question based on this that secured uh, sarfc only uh, provides protection to the secured creditor or it covers only the secured creditor you can very well write this in the answer that no it it provides recourse for both secured as well as unsecured creditor the uh, for secured creditor there are multiple recourses or multiple options that are available here however if it's an unsecured creditor you have only one activity that you can do that is the reconstruction of financial asset okay uh, so that's what is being given here so you need not uh, be a secured creditor to give extension for the loan you need not be a secured creditor to convert the loan you cannot need not be a secured creditor to waive off and settle the loan okay but yes to enforce the security interest or to do the securitization activity right to issue security receipts so security receipts would be issued when you are secured if you are unsecured you cannot issue security receipts so that's what is being given here and enforcement of security interest also talks about the same thing that security interest uh, has to be you know enforcement of security interest comes from this particular point that you are a secured creditor and you have created and why you are secured because you have created security interest you have created so simple language from a company law point of view you have created a charge okay you have you have created a charge on the assets of the borrower so that's how you are secured so you can invoke that charge okay so that's where the security interest comes into picture and uh, enforce you are enforcing that security interest where you say that you can take control over the assets of the borrower you can take or uh, take over the management of the borrower so multiple uh, activities that you can do under the esi activity technically there are four activities which you can do under the esi activity so sarfci was also constitutionally challenged just like any other law uh, ibc was also constitutionally challenged so sarfci was also constitutionally challenged so new syllabus students uh, i'm sure you must have gone through multiple case studies right in the multidisciplinary case study subject right i'm i'm very sure you have seen multiple uh, judgments under the ibc right if you are giving group 3 module 3 also so you have gone through in case you have not then uh, probably whenever you are going to appear for the third group you are going to 
uh, come across this subject called as multidisciplinary case study and in that insolvency you have read multiple judgments the sans steel judgment then dharani sugar judgment then um, there are multiple judgments like you name and in insolvency you have multiple judgments which are there so i have not closely watched the module of uh, multidisciplinary case study but i am sure all these judgments you must have gone through but there is one judgment which is there in the sarfasi okay where it was constitutionally challenged okay and insolvency also it was constitutionally challenged section 29a was constitutionally challenged there were multiple provisions which were constitutionally challenged but Sarfasi was constitutionally challenged uh, at Supreme Court uh, in the case of Mardia Chemicals versus the Union of India. Uh, the facts of this case are already given in the module. I'll, I'll briefly discuss the facts of the case and then uh, probably you can just read it from the module. And if you have any doubts, you can get in touch with me in person. Right. So, uh, Sarfasi Act was constitutionally challenged in this case where Mardia Chemicals said that, you know, the provisions of this act are uh, brutal, right? It provides uh, you know excess it gives excess power to the secured creditor uh, this is constitutionally challenged because uh, it it basically the freedom to do the business it it invokes that particular right right it, it creates a bar and on uh, right to do the business and this is not correct right this law is very uh, brutal so again supreme court upheld the validity of this particular law because uh, supreme court said multiple things that uh, this act gives the power to the secured creditor to take over the business okay only when uh, there is a default and also it's not that upon default the secured creditor does this after that you know you have to wait for 90 days then the account becomes an npa only then you get that and in fact if you have to do the esi activity after the accounts become NPA, that's 90 days you again have to wait for 60 days time period that we will do when we do esi activity so you wait for 60 days you give a notice of 60 days and again so after this is i'm telling you after 90 days you give a notice of 60 days so a reasonable amount of time has been given to the borrower to pay the money so if you remember yesterday we did in the ppirp debtor in possession creditor in possession so when you are performing asset you are, it is a debtor in possession when you are a non-performing asset it can become a creditor in possession so that's very well within the rights of the creditor and of course the banks and the financial institutions cannot just uh, have a more you know they cannot bound over the increasing nps it the law basically npa crisis was the major issue it was a major issue then also and it's a major issue till now right so even after two decades we are dealing with the same issue not even two right i would say three to three four decades we are still dealing with the same issue that's the npa crisis right so uh, banks cannot just sit over the nps right they also have an obligation they have it's not that they have printed the currency they have printed the money they have also borrowed money from someone right and they are answerable they are still liable to pay to them so if the or the businesses are completely or the borrowers are going to default and banks would not be allowed to do the recovery then in that case how their business is going to survive so you have been given a reasonable opportunity uh, so you need to pay otherwise from debtor in possession to creditor in possession however this term has not been used in the judgment but just for your understanding sake right uh, you can very well use these terms in the answer also even though it was not part of the judgment but to understand or to write the elaborated provisions of the case right or the explanation or your understanding of the case you can very well use this word and in turn you can also this way uh, show to the examiner that this debtor in possession and creditor in possession you are aware of this particular concept also and you have understood it well the only provision which was uh, you know basically pointed out by supreme court was that when uh, the actions are taken by surfacing okay the borrower can approach to DRT in certain cases. Okay. So after the order of DRT, let's say the borrower wants to appeal. Okay. So they'll have to go to debt recovery appellate tribunal. So here it was in the surface, I said that if the borrower appeals, if the secured creditor banks and the financial institutions, they appeal, there is no problem. But if the borrower appeals, borrower will have to deposit a 75% of the amount involved. 
Now, this was little burdensome on the company, right, on the borrower, because if let's say 75% of the amount is already there with the borrower, then in that case, the borrower would readily pay that 75% amount to the bank and the financial institution and very well settle the account for balance 25%. They can have some sort of a negotiation, if not a wave off. They can have some sort of a negotiation in terms of extension of time or there can be some sale of the assets and basically the recovery can be done. So the borrower does not have this 75% of the money. That's the reason the borrower has defaulted. So this provision that to appeal borrower needs to deposit 75% of the amount due uh, with the debt recovery appellate tribunal, this was wrong. So Supreme Court said that this particular provision should be striked off. However, uh, from 75%, this amount was reduced to 50%. So now today, if the borrower has to appeal, the borrower is going to deposit 50% of the amount with the appellate tribunal, where uh, a proviso was added and it said that if the debt recovery appellate tribunal wants, they can reduce this amount to 25%, right? So you see from 75, you still have a provision till 25%. So this was the case of Mardia chemicals, right? Now, if you see, uh, bank can invoke action both under uh, IBC as well as Sarfasi. So if you get this sort of a question, so answer to this question is uh, yes. So banks can do that. Uh, for IBC, you just need the default. And for Sarfasi, you need that eligibility. What are the eligibilities? The eligibilities is basically there has to be a default. After default, the account should become a non-performing asset and after it becomes non-performing asset you can do the esi activity right and for ibc it's straight away you can uh, initiate action against the borrower when the default takes place so this is what i have been uh, i have discussed already with you all so this is with with an example i have discussed so just remember new syllabus student this slide is very important for all of you because it contains the definition of the npa so you can make a diagram like this in the exam also or maybe you can make this straight timeline like I had made before. So here you can write default and from here you can just make that particular type, right? So this is the securitization activity. Again, the most important question from your examination point of view that the bank uh, is going to lend the money, okay? The bank is going to lend money to the borrower and the borrower will create a security interest over its property. This security interest would get transferred to the asset reconstruction company based on that the asset reconstruction company is going to formulate multiple schemes and issue security interest to the qualified buyers now understand the word used is qualified buyers and it uh, is not qualified institutional buyers there is a difference between the two so avoid writing the word institutional buyers it's qualified buyers now Shristi has asked a question that banks would prefer ibc so uh Shristi, the answer to this question would be it would depend what is the intention of the bank okay one and second it would uh, totally depend on what is the amount of the borrowing so if bank believes because ibc is a lengthy process okay it's a lengthy process plus it's a uh, you know i would say uh it's a costly affair because uh the insolvency resolution process cost would be part of the resolution plan if the resolution plan is received okay if the resolution plan is not received then in that case the cost and all initial cost is to be borne by the creditor so whether the financial creditor or the operational creditor whosoever invokes right the cirp right the application under section 7 or under section 9 that person uh, initially all that public advertisement and uh, newspaper advertisement payment to the prof resolution professional interim resolution professional so all those expenses are to be borne by the uh, applicant of uh, in ibc so if uh, the borrower believes if the banks and the financial institution believe that why to go to this ibc process and do all these uh, lengthy thing uh, the account has already become a npa you know this uh, 60 day notice just give that 60 days notice and ask them that pay the money once you pay the money and you can have this so you can do the recovery so it totally depends it would be again a question of fact rather than a question of law yes astaji absolutely what you have said that uh, when moratorium is imposed then uh, the moratorium is also uh, on the securitization activity basically on the CRPC activities cannot be done so of course that's what i said multiple factors would be taken into consideration bank would also consider this part that what is the probability that 
while we do the securitization uh, while we invoke the enforcement of security interest in the meantime if someone files the application under ibc and uh, let's say the moratorium gets imposed then technically we also cannot do anything we also have to go through the ibc process only so it would totally depend on the comp uh, borrower on a case to case basis okay now if you are under uh, just under trying to understand what is this so basically the banks and the financial institution will charge to the borrower let's say a loan of uh, interest at the rate 18% however to on security receipts it would pay 12% interest so basically 6% is the gain which is there so on from one hand they give money to the borrower and on the second hand they receive the money from these qualified buyers when they issue these security receipts now understand also understand one thing that when these security receipts are being issued who is liable if there is a default so if there is a default from the end of the borrower the asset reconstruction company cannot say to qualified buyers that oh so i'm so sorry that you know there is a default you know there is a default from the borrower end so we cannot pay money to you because the asset reconstruction company has issued security receipts they are solely liable irrespective whether they can recover that money from the borrower or not so that's the risk which the, the asset reconstruction company or the banks and the financial institutions they are undertaking here so the securitization activity step 1 uh, financial assistance is ex uh, extended to the borrower who is called as the obligor now try to understand uh, when you write in the at the professional level when you try to write the answer use this word financial assistance because that's the definition which is provided in the sarfasi act so the moment you write financial assistance it gives automatically enhances the value of your uh, answer because in terms of the language you have written a better word you have used the better words right so just write financial assistance is extended to the borrower who is, and in bracket you can write obliger so financial assistance you can write in the bracket loan has been extended to the borrower and then the borrower will create the security interest in favor of the banks or the financial institution who is called as the originator to secure this financial assistance now the bank will transfer the account of the borrower to the asset reconstruction company which makes the asset reconstruction company as the deemed lender okay and then now the asset reconstruction company can do the recovery and receive their cash flows uh, step 4 asset reconstruction company is going to formulate separate schemes so that's like how mutual fund uh, aif they create multiple schemes and based on that they do the recovery so the asset reconstruction company is also going to formulate separate schemes and then based on that they are going to issue the security receipts they are going to issue the security receipts to the qualified buyers and the amount which is received from the issue of security receipts issue of the security receipts to the qualified buyer would be given to the bank and then the proceeds received from the borrower will be used by the arc to pay the dues to the qualified buyer which includes both the principal as well as the interest repayment right and in this arc in this entire process they make money via commission the gap between the interest what it receives and what it pays through the securitization process so that's the return for the arc so this is again i have given that another the same example there right so this is a simpler diagram with step one multiple steps so what you can do you can uh, just draw this this sort of a diagram right and you can write s1 s2 s3 s4 draw this diagram with pen not with pencil and then probably you can write these six steps and uh, you can complete your answer like this now understand if the borrower defaults then the arc uh, in default will have to still redeem the security receipts to the qualified buyers so who is going to bear the risk of the borrower it is the banks and the arc they are collectively liable for this particular loan depending upon what kind of agreement has been entered between the bank and the arc okay um, then we have step 3 where the arc is going to be uh, established so arc is basically asset reconstruction company is basically a company which has a net net owned fund of 100 crores okay minimum 100 crores and uh, it's basically an nbfc okay but uh, so it requires a registration with the reserve bank of india and what are the pre conditions for uh, uh, pre conditions for the asset reconstruction company the registration process there shouldn't be any losses in the preceding three financial years adequate form arrangements must have been made by them for the recovery then the directors must have adequate experience and qualifications plus uh, the directors must not have been uh, 
convicted in the case of moral turpitude the sponsor should be fit and proper person and compliance with the rbi guidelines and the prudential norms so based on this the asset reconstruction company will be given the registration and who is going to give the registration the registration would be given by the reserve bank of india and uh, the cancellation of the arc so if the arc ceases to carry on the business of the asset reconstruction or securitization business or if they cease to hold any investments from the qualified buyers if fails to comply with the preconditions right the conditions on which the uh, license was given to them not license basically the approval the registration was given to them right and then if they fail to comply with the by the way this is all due right fail to comply with the preconditions of the directions issued by the reserve bank of india if uh, they don't maintain accounts as per the reserve bank of india if they do not submit the books of accounts then in that case uh, you have uh, where the asset reconstruction companies uh, registration would get cancelled also uh, when the whenever there is going to be change okay whenever there is going to be change in the management okay or there is going to be change in the location of the registered office of the arc or there is going to be change in the name of the asset reconstruction company it requires prior rbi approval now understand when we say the change in the management this is going to be substantial change in the management due to mergers and amalgamation okay so if it is the routine uh, change in the management where the direct, or directors are retiring and you have directors getting appointed that's fine but if it is pursuant to the mergers and amalgamation where you have all together new sponsors new promoters in the asset reconstruction company it would require a prior approval of the reserve bank of india and if they fail to take this prior approval from the reserve bank of india in that case it would be considered as uh, a violation of one of the preconditions and that's where uh, the reserve bank of india is going to charge uh, basically cancel the registration it may cancel the Uh, registration of the asset reconstruction company also rbi is going to decide whether the change in the management is substantial or it is not and that is going to be uh, full and final now if let's say your registration is being cancelled then the only way is you can uh, approach to the central government for the recovery basically you can challenge that. otherwise there is no way you can challenge the order of the reserve bank of india now originator is basically the owner of the financial assets right uh, financial asset means the loan account of the borrower so that's the financial institution right so this is again the diagram which has been given so here you can understand from section wise so under section 3 the incorporation section 4 that's the cancellation of the registration of the arc and then you have section 5 where an agreement is being entered between uh, the banks and the financial institutions and the asset reconstruction company under section 6 uh you have an agreement between the bank and the financial institutions uh, and the borrower so whatever payments are made to the by the borrower to the banks and the financial institutions or whatever payments are made by the borrower to the asset reconstruction company that would be a valid discharge then under section 7 the asset reconstruction company gets the power to issue the qualified uh, you know security receipts to the qualified buyers that's the securitization activity which is under done under section 7 then uh, uh, under section 9 the asset reconstruction company can do the reconstruction of financial assets and under section 13 it can do the esi activity so this pretty much sums up all the multiple activities which the asset reconstruction activity can do and the sarkesi act as a whole then uh, like i mentioned uh, okay so borrower account so detailed of the esi activity so the borrower defaults then again the borrower's accounts become npa now since the borrower's account has become npa the secured creditor sc is not supreme court here sc is the secured creditor okay it's the secured creditor the secured creditor is going to issue a notice to the borrower providing for two things one is that uh, it demands the payment within a period of 60 days so that 90 days after that 60 days and if uh, the payment is not made on the 60 within these 60 days what action the secured creditor is going to take proposed action that the secured creditor is going to take against the borrower this has to be provided in the notice thereafter the borrower is going to make representation to the secured creditor that um, you know this uh, activity the action should not be taken against the secured creditor or you know the action should not be taken by the secured creditor because it's a genuine issue and it's not a willful default which we are doing so 
it, it is basically whatever representations the borrower wants to make in the in its defense they can make their representations to the secured creditor and thereafter it is totally up to the secured creditor to decide whether or not to accept those representations or reject so if they accept those representations then in that case there will be no esi activity because you have basically come to an understanding with the there is there is an understanding now between the secured creditor and the borrower but if the secured creditor rejects then in that case uh, reply along with the reasons within 15 days and then borrowers cannot even appeal unless any action is taken right the borrowers will not be able to take any action right uh, unless the appeal is made uh, basically to you know uh, at the drts right so that's what and also the borrower cannot compel uh, to the secured creditor that you cannot take any action 61st day the secured creditor as per the Marthia chemicals and union of india judgment they are very well within their rights to take any sort of an action which they want on provided under section 13 and also they've informed that in the notice now if the borrower fails to pay the money within 60 days 61st day it's the secured creditor right uh, it can take all the actions which are provided okay under the surface act right so this is this was there in your surface act now just a minute i think uh, there is one more slide to it which i i feel is either not updated here or uh, just just give me a minute i think there is one slide which is not here and i'll just quickly open that particular slide because that has a detailed one just give me a minute Yeah, so sorry. So this is another another slide. I think I, I accidentally opened that particular slide. This might hurt your eyes a little. Just a minute. Yeah. Okay. So. yeah so sorry so let's let's come back to section number 7 so section 7 it says that the security receipts which will be issued by the asset reconstruction company so the asset reconstruction company okay the asset reconstruction company is going to issue okay it is going to issue the security receipts to the qualified buyers uh, and this would be done via various schemes so various schemes which means you'll have uh, different accounts for each such scheme so that you realize the financial assets and each financial asset realization is applied to that particular scheme okay and it is used towards the redemption so let's say there are five borrowers and their account looks similar so it has been put in one scheme so this is let's say s1 then let's say there are uh, three another similar sort of the borrowers those tenures and all are same so that's the second scheme so, so when the amount will be received from these five borrowers it will be realized for this particular scheme and there will be no merging of the money right the pretty much concept of uh, the mutual funds and the aifs right so you don't merge multiple schemes here so in the event of non-realization so the qualified buyers uh, holding the security receipts at least 75 percent in the value what they can do is they can call for a meeting of all qualified buyers they can pass a resolution in that particular meeting and that would be binding on the arc so that's where i say the arc is personally responsible for the uh, recovery right and here if you see under section 9 so financial assets so what what ac what actions you know arc can take under section 9 so it can take over the management and the business of the borrower right it can also sell or lease the part or whole part of the business it can reschedule the business okay it can also enforce the security interests so esi activity like i mentioned it is part of the rafa activity only 
settlement of the dues with the borrower right it can take possession of the secured assets convert any part of debt into the shares so you have the cdr mechanism which are given here so not all are for unsecured some are them can be done by the unsecured creditors like this can be done by unsecured creditors uh, this can be done by an unsecured creditor you can reschedule this can be done by sec unsecured creditor you need not be a secured creditor to do these activities so like i mentioned the rafa activity is for both the secured as well as an unsecured creditor uh, under section 10 it says that uh, there are three functions of the asset reconstruction company it acts like a manager agent manager and receiver of the funds or the money from the obliger right so the, from the borrower it can do the recovery then uh, section 13 so here from here on section 13 gets started so enforcement of security interest you have defaulted now the asset reconstruction company right is going to uh, invoke the esi activity so what it will do uh, in this it can take uh, possession of the assets of the borrower okay it can take the possession of the secured assets okay of the borrower then the next multiple options which are there it can also take over the management of the business of the borrower it can also appoint a manager to manage the assets of the secured creditor right uh, sorry the borrowers right and then it can also require any person who has uh, acquired any of the secured assets from the borrower to whom the money is due. so let's say the secured asset was sold to someone or let's say it has been sold to someone and the amount is still to be paid so what the bank can do is basically recover the money from that person to whom it has been sold and whatever the amount is paid to the secured creditor that would be uh, you know a valid discharge for the loan provided the entire amount gets secured so if the entire amount doesn't get secured then in that case uh, they'll go to drt so okay i'll also write one thing uh, what uh, the banks and the financial institution are going to do so the banks oblique the financial institutions okay the bank oblique the financial institutions they will go so they will do the esi activity okay from esi activity they'll have to check whether 100 percent recovery is done or not so if 100 percent recovery is done okay if 100 percent recovery is done very good the borrower is free the banks and the financial institutions they are also free if 100 percent recovery is not done then the next recourse is the banks and the financial institution is going to approach the debt recovery tribunal for the balance recovery so now do you understand how uh, surface and drt are connected and that's the reason both of them constitute as one chapter in your module at least in your syllabus so this is the uh, scheme which is there right i'm sorry i go little haphazard when i teach right especially when it comes to the revision session not especially only in the revision session it goes little haphazard that's because uh, the moment i realize something is important or it is relevant for your exam or it can be asked so that's the reason i just pointed out so that's what the ldr session is all about but i make try to make sure that everything is being uh, covered here okay in the exam okay uh, whatever can be asked in the exam so it is there so uh, when you enforce the security interest right so any security interest created can be enforced okay without the intervention of the court tribunal or the creditors but the only thing is that the debt should be secured and it should become a non performing asset thereafter the notice will be given the 60 days prior notice will be given and thereafter the esi activity will be taken so what secured creditor is going to do secured creditor is going to issue the demand notice uh, that 60 days time period and this demand notice would be issued in writing and it will be issued by the secured creditor or the authorized officer and it will be delivered to the secure to the borrower uh, either by hand delivery or by registered post acknowledgement due courier email so basically there needs to be a trace right because uh, let's say 61st day if the bank or the financial institution secured creditor is invoking esi activity the borrower very well can go to drt and say that see i haven't received those 60 days notice hence the banks should be 
you know not allowed so an injunction order should be passed against the secured creditor that they should not take any action they should first issue the demand notice to me so that's the reason the law clearly provides that uh, there should be some sort of an evidence that this demand notice was being issued and that's the reason it has been given that there should be a hand delivery so hand delivery you won't click a picture okay when you do a hand delivery you won't click a picture with the borrower that see i had given the notice basically you get a receiving okay when you do so you take two copies okay one copy is to be kept with the borrower and the second copy they give a receiving okay and uh, registered port, post with acknowledgement due registered post so that's again you have a evidence courier also you have a evidence the tracking number that it has been delivered and email again you have a so email id whether it has been read by the borrower or not so it is possible that the email goes to the spam folder okay but again 61st day the borrower cannot say that see i have never received an email so the email is still sent because the bank would say hey this is my outbox okay check my sent item the email has been sent to you so you ignored it you accidentally missed it or it went to spam folder that's not my problem i am very well within my rights to take the action because i have sent the uh, demand notice via email okay now uh, if let's say the borrower tries to avoid the service of notice because whatever action the bank is going to take it's after those 90 days so in any way uh, the borrower tries to uh, avoid the notice in that case what is going to happen in that case the secured creditor can affix the copy of the demand notice outside the house or the building of the secured creditor where they do the business or let's say they reside ordinarily they reside and they will also publish the content of the demand notice in two leading newspapers plus one vernacular language having sufficient circulation in the locality so i would say in the month of uh, august august yes in the month of august i did one uh, this publishing of the demand notice for one of the client okay and we published it in two newspapers one was economic times and uh, there was one Gujarati newspaper and there was one Marathi newspaper. So Marathi newspaper because the company, uh, Gujarati newspaper because it was there in the, the company was from Gujarat and Marathi newspaper because it was listed at Bombay Stock Exchange and Economic Times. So we had given it uh, in three newspapers, right? And which should have a sufficient circulation in that particular locality, right? So the secured creditor, right, they will give notice and this notice, if the borrower wants to make any objection, they can do that. And all objections, if they want to raise, they can do that within 15 days. After 15 days, they cannot raise any objections and, and they can also make their representations. Okay. The secured creditor may accept or may reject whatever is, uh, they'll communicate it to that. And what will be the procedure for the secured creditor? after the notice has been issued so the amount will be mentioned in the demand notice if it still remains unpaid then the secured creditor will authorize one of its officers to go and realize the amount by adopting any of the measures which are given in section 13 subsection 4. now the secured asset can be a movable property or it can be an immovable property and you can do the recovery of that particular asset so for a movable property right uh, the authorized officer will take custody of that particular movable property, that asset. And if let's say that asset is uh, subject to natural decay or speedy recovery, right? Or let's say the expenses of holding that particular asset is going to be more than its value, then the authorized officer will sell it at once. It will not wait. If it's a movable property, then in that case, uh, it will fix a reserve price for that asset. And then those bidding and all would be done for, and that's how the recovery would be made. Now, how the sale can be done? It can be done by obtaining quotations or inviting tenders, hold public auctions, or you can do a private treaty where privately you can go and sell. And for this, you will have to give a public notice in these three newspapers, right? And the authorized officer will give notice to the borrower 30 days that we are going to sell your movable asset, except it is if it's a asset which is perishable in nature. Otherwise, it will be just sold there and then. Uh, then if let's say the sale is successful then in that case the payments will be made and if let's say the payment is enough so uh, then it's fine if not then again another property would be sold okay and let's say if the payment of the sale price is not received the 
subsequent buyer also defaulted so a was the original borrower whose assets movable property was to be sold it was sold to b in the auction okay and let's say b also failed to pay then in that case the property would again go to the auction and you will resell that amount and if it is the recovery amount is being received from b the amount whatever was there is received from b in that case the authorized officer will issue a certificate and that will be the prima facie evidence that the borrower the purchaser of that particular asset has a valid title over that particular asset and if let's say the sale is unsuccessful then again after 15 days uh, they will try to sell it again if it's an immovable property then again the possession and notice will be given and it will be published in the newspaper and the authorized officer is required to take care of the uh, property as a owner of the ordinary prudence would do and before actually effecting the sale the authorized officer will obtain the valuation of the property fix a reserve price and then again do the same thing submit uh, you know uh, send server notice to the borrower for 30 days and then let's say uh, try to recover that money now mode of sale is again going to be same right sale price will be uh, you know to whom it would be sold whosoever is bidded for the highest price but it should not be less than the reserve price so for immovable property 25 percent of the amount is to be paid on the same day or the next working day and the balance is to be paid within those 15 days which can be again extended to three months now if let's say uh, the amount the balance amount is paid within 15 days next 15 days it's fine if not then whatever this 25 percent has been paid by the purchaser this will get forfeited and that property would be resold again so this is of course if there is a default now again remember this is the default by the buyer okay not by the borrower this is the default by the buyer okay thereafter uh this is fine so if you're doing a joint financing okay mm -hmm. then in case of joint financing you need the consent of 60 percent in value so i think uh, i've written here 66 percent this is 60 percent in value just one minute I, I can confirm it just one minute okay uh, let me open One hundred seventy. Yeah, it's sixty percent. Right. This is sixty percent. Okay. So it's written sixty six percent there. It was accidentally written sixty six percent there. It's sixty percent. Okay. I'll just correct it here. It is basically you get you need the approval from okay, just a minute this is 60 right so let's say uh, multiple borrowers have given the financial assistance extended the financial assistance and they have created the security interest over the same asset now you would ask why but uh, let's say it's a pool of assets okay it's a consortium of loan then in that case 60 percent of them should agree in value and that's how you can do the activity the esi activity you can do also uh, when we say that the secured creditor can you proceed against the borrower uh, directly answer is yes you can proceed against the borrower directly if there are let's say guarantors then can you proceed against the guarantor directly answer is yes so it's totally up to the secured creditor that they wherever they want to go they can proceed so it's not that they have to first proceed against the borrower and then when the recovery is not done they will come to the guarantor they can straight away come to the guarantor as soon as the borrower has defaulted okay uh, so this is what like i said the dues were for 100 crores and the amount recovered is 80 so for the balance the secured creditor would make application to the drt within next 45 days and if let's say uh, appeal is made to the drat right and in that case the appeal would be made within 30 days after the order of the drat and where i said the appellant is the borrower right if the appellant is the borrower then again they have to deposit at least 50 percent of the amount due okay 
which can be again reduced to 25% for the reasons to be recorded in writing. Then there is something called as central registry. So central registry is basically it is set up by the central government and it is basically same like how uh, when you create charge, okay. So when you create charge and you deposit the forms to ROC upon creation, modification and satisfaction, satisfaction of the charge, same thing when the banks and the financial institution do the ESI activity or whatever they do, right? When they create the security interest, right? They are going to do the registry. So each time, whenever there is going to be a securitization activity or reconstruction of financial asset or the ESI activity, uh, the central registry uh, needs to be updated with that. Okay. And that's what has been given here. So central registrar is there who's going to maintain all the records for the central registry okay so this is there uh, also uh, I'll, I'll quickly take you to the module for some of the points uh, one is that uh, the secured creditor can also take assistance of the chief metropolitan magistrate or the district magistrate in case uh, the borrower is likely to act or create some sort of a hurdles in the recovery process so if you remember that movie if you have seen that movie raid movie Right, so it's it's a typical that type of a situation that you believe that the borrower is not going to uh, hand over the property or there there can be some violence or something. So in that case, uh, the secured creditor would say, "I'll not do anything. I'll straight away go to the magistrate. I will convince the magistrate that this is the situation. And what is the situation that you are a secured creditor? You had extended the financial assistance. Basically, you'll have to explain the entire process." To the chief metropolitan magistrate or the district magistrate that this is what i had uh, you know i had extended the financial assistance and i had created security interest on this particular asset this was the amount then the notice the borrower has defaulted it has become npa secure notice you know that notice was given to that particular borrower so all that has to be provided see the same thing in the application it has to be the secured creditor has to declare these things that the aggregate amount of financial assistance which was given, what is the claim which is there, borrower has created security interest, right, and give details of all those property, borrower has committed the default, the account is classified as non-performing asset, you affirm that you had given the notice of 60 days period, then objections and replies was, you know, whatever objections or representations were made, you have replied to that and the borrower has still not made the payment and now you are entitled to take possession of the assets. So that's where the chief metropolitan magistrate after satisfying with all the uh, declarations which you have made, uh, it will order to the police that the as property should be taken and it should be given in the custody of the secured creditor. So that's what is being given here. So this can be one of the questions. Now how the management would be taken over? So when the borrower has defaulted, the secured creditor can again take over the management of the borrower and to take over the management of the borrower, you understand the existing management would go. Okay. So here, if you see, it will just uh, invoke that notice, invoke the activity, ESI activity, and it will say that now I am taking over the management of the borrower. So this too says that the old management bye-bye. So this is buy to the old or the existing management and uh, C and D is basically welcome the new directors or the new management, which is being appointed by the secured creditor. This uh, new management is going to continue and take over the business and is going to run the company. Now understand here, it says that notwithstanding, right? So it's a non obstante clause, which has been provided. So the management of the the new management of the borrower okay the new management of the borrower the board of directors now understand irrespective whatever is written in the act memorandum or articles of association the borrower okay will not be lawful like the shareholders cannot pass any resolution and nominate anyone to be appointed as a director of the company no resolution will have any effect until the borrower agrees for that and um, no proceeding of winding up will be made except with the consent of the secured creditor. So take, just understand all the powers which are given to the shareholders of the company. Okay. In the companies act, right. Uh, is again, it vests in the hands of the 
borrower so without the borrowers so it, it was in the hands of the secured creditor okay so the secured creditor uh, any decision which will be taken in the business of the borrower it's the secured creditor who will give the consent and only then it is going to happen and also when these old management would be terminated there would be no compensation that would be given to them however their outstanding salaries if there is any existing dues that would be definitely paid okay so this is one part uh, then understand this appeal part i have covered so again uh, right to lodge caveat this is again a important question okay from examination point of view i i have the answer in one of the image so i'll just share that image right now i'll open it and you can read that okay so from there we can do this so what is basically caveat caveat is basically you lodge a caveat in uh, to the court that i should be informed before any order is being made i should be informed any decision that is to be taken in this particular case i should be informed so this is where the lodge uh, lodge of the caveat work comes into picture so where application has been made to the court okay or a drt or high court the secured creditor can lodge uh, the caveat okay and caveat is basically a warning which is given by the person to the court that not to grant any relief or uh, not to pass any order against the other side till that time they are not being given the notice or without affording them opportunity of being heard so that's there and then the notice of caveat has been lodged and this uh, caveat will be remain valid for a period of 90 days this will remain period valid for a 90 days and after that a fresh caveat has to be filed to the court or to the tribunal so this is one of the uh, most important question i would say old syllabus they have been asking a lot of question explain why what is right to lodge caveat so 18 uh, you know section 18c right to lodge caveat so this is the entire section and this i have just summed up in five points uh, so from examination perspective this is important you can take a screenshot of this also it will be helpful uh, moving ahead uh, here central registry i have covered now there is one question uh, which is again very very important uh, and again it's a repeated question right that uh, the cases where uh, surface act will not be applicable right so when the lien has been created okay surface cannot be invoked where it's, where it's the pledge and uh, of the movable property under the indian contract act section 72 again uh, you cannot have surface uh, creation of security interest uh, on any aircraft any vessel you don't have the right so unpaid seller don't have the right then uh, any property which is not liable for the attachment okay so that's also not uh, a valid you cannot create or you cannot enforce security interest on that uh, then if the amount does not exceed the financial asset the financial assistance do not exceed one lakh rupees again you cannot invoke ibc uh, security interest cannot be created on the agricultural land and if the amount due including the principal as well as the interest amount the total amount outstanding is less than 20 percent so again you cannot uh, file or take action against the borrower in these surfaces so this says that as per section 31 the provisions of this act shall not apply to so this is one question straight away question you can get in the exam now civil court will have the no jurisdiction that's the drt drt will no have no jurisdiction oh, sorry i'm so sorry the civil court will have no jurisdiction so whatever uh, application has to be made it has to be made to the drt and the drat of course uh, the writ petition can be filed to the supreme court right uh, but that's not uh, under this act that's basically under the constitution of india so no provision can uh, curtail the powers and the rights or whatever provisions have been made in the constitution then again it says that the provisions of the limitation act would be very well applicable so um, if it's a time bar then again you cannot do any any action you cannot take any action which is there this is the security enforcement rules that i have already covered so this part like you can already you can you can finish it off with the help of the slides right so these slides that i had discussed it was the security enforcement rules only so you can refer the slides and cover these points in a very simplified diagrammatic way i have covered it so you need not go through the entire part right just go through those slides and you can handle it now for debt recovery tribunal uh, you have drt one and then 
the appellate tribunal is the dr 80 now by the way the law name has been changed why because uh, now it is no longer recovery of debt due to the banks in the financial institutions act it is uh, recovery of debts and insolvency act right so I, I again don't feel that the composition of the tribunal and all these are the questions which institute is going to ask so i'm not covering this part okay so that's that's all for this particular chapter uh, surface i have covered in very much in detail and from this chapter it's basically the surface act which is extremely extremely important and those provisions i have covered in detail okay so the recovery officers and all right so i think if you cover only this much in surface it would be like more than sufficient and for drt just again uh, check the scanner questions uh, do only those questions that would be more than sufficient right so next lecture we are going to start with winding up that's tomorrow and uh, probably saturday we will start with the cross border insolvency and if not saturday then probably i'll, I'll take cross border insolvency on uh, sunday or I'll, I'll share a recorded lecture we'll record it and i'll share it in advance so that's it that's it for your today's lecture i hope uh, surface is must be clear to all of you and at least you must have brushed up the surface provisions properly so that's it then take care bye bye don't forget to like this video if you have survived till now okay